what advice would you have for an artist um, who has never done, is not really familiar with crypto art, but is thinking about it? What mm. advice would you have for them um, entering this world? Yeah, uh, I think first advice specifically for crypto art is to think of blockchain and cryptocurrency as separate. Okay, this is probably not to uh, people from countries where cryptocurrency is a common thing and everything, but from people uh, from countries like ours, uh, from India, or maybe some of the other countries uh, where cryptocurrency is a totally new thing to enter into. And everybody is reluctant to enter into because, you know, there is a lot of uh, apprehension there. I would say keep that separate. There is this whole blockchain world where you are making digital art rare. We are not uh, talking about, uh, you know, the whole economics or the tokenomics of it. We are talking about uh, a community where you are making, just like how uh, traditional uh, physical art was rare, uh, we are talking about rare digital art. Now let's see how it works there. Uh, come into this world, start putting up a couple of works and see how it goes. I would say uh, have an experimental mind initially and see how it evolves. And the most important thing is connect with people, learn from others. You need to connect with people to understand how to navigate these platforms, but also if you could, uh, you know, make sure that there is kind of a two-way uh, mutual, uh, mutual uh, connection between them with them then that will help you grow also i talked the example of how indrani suddenly retweeted some of my works initially itself so that helped me a lot so that will help you grow also but uh, to anyone starting i would see be experimental about things we have an open mind and you know just start uh, trying out things people know people uh, people in this area know that we all make mistakes, a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes when I came here. And we all learn from that. So just be open to making mistakes and learn from them. Hey peeps, what's up? I'm Anne-Marie Alanis, and this is Rare Digital Bird, a series about artists, their creations, and their experiences, both good and bad, using blockchain technology. In episode one and two, we discussed how blockchains are software that you can build apps or websites on, and that they allow us to keep track of who owns what, when, and how much. But why is this particular software so important? Blockchain software provides ways for people like you and me to create a variety of systems together for trading things of value, like art, money, loans, music, limited edition sneakers, and more, trading these things with each other in a fair way, in a way that we can all trust. Our current system for trading things of value involves governments and powerful platforms. Governments create the physical currency we use today within that system. As Jared Scott mentioned in episode one, our currency is also called legal tender. This piece of paper is valued at a dollar because the law says so and because we all agree to abide by this law for this particular currency. But what if we gave ourselves additional options? What if we created our own system for trading things of value without depending on the rules established by the select and privileged few like Uber, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, or the world's governments? What if we worked together to make decisions on how these systems should be run? That is what we are experimenting with now. That's what blockchain technology endeavors to do, to put more power into the hands of the people. That's why blockchain is so important. And that's why it's important for you to be involved in some way so you have a say in how these new systems develop. Now, if you're an artist who's considering exploring the crypto art world, or if you're a blockchain dev interested in creating something better that artists will want to use, consider clicking on the subscribe button and the notification bell. For our third episode, I'm honored to welcome today's guest, Fabin Rashid. You can often find this India-based creative technologist at the leading edge of art and technology, experimenting and diving into interaction design, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and even his own generative, interactive, and participatory artworks. 
His projects have been featured in Mashable, Popular Science, and Indian Express. He's exhibited his artwork at Ars Electronica 2020, Florence Biennial 2019, Contemporary Art and Digital Art Fair 2020, Cueva Gallery 2020, Cobalt Gallery 2019, and Rework AI Summit, just to name a few. He's worked for Xerox Research and the Innovation Labs of Adobe. As an innovator, he's accomplished many firsts. He presented his major work of animation brushes called Brush Bounty at the main stage of Adobe Max 2018 as a sneak peek into future tech. He created the first generative, interactive, and participatory art on async.art. He may have also created the first photographic programmable art on async. Currently, you can find his art on makersplace.com and async.art. One thing I noticed about Fabin is that he doesn't just use the crypto art platforms to display his artworks. In true innovative fashion, he takes his new ideas, reaches out to the teams of the crypto art platforms he uses, and works with them to explore the possibilities. Hi, Fabin. How are you? Hello, Anne. I'm, I'm really great. How are you? Awesome. Let's start with uh, your story of how you got into art in the first place. What brought you into hmm. the world of art? Okay, so that's that's kind of a question which goes back many years back to my childhood, I would say. Uh, when I was a child, I probably started scribbling, uh, and there was this, uh, so we have these uh, examination times, right, for uh, when we are in school, we have this exam, this test we have to take, and, you know, we have to uh, write the examination, and then by the end of this test, uh, you have some spare time till it gets over. So that's when I started scribbling stuff. And there were these posters stuck on my school walls, and I'll just try to, you know, imitate that and draw it uh, down on my paper. And sometimes even my test papers had all those uh, scribbles here and there. So that's probably where <laughs> I started sketching. But then over time, things have evolved. I learned a lot of 3D. I love 3D, and I used to work a lot in 3D since childhood. Uh, one of the oh. things was uh, this, this whole thing about Harry Potter. When Harry Potter released, uh, so there was this uh, sequence where, uh, you know, we have this dragon sequence. So I tried to make that in 3D and see. And this was in the early, early days, uh, some of those early days uh, when I started with 3D and I was trying to mimic that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that is kind of where it all started, evolving uh, into what I'm right now, yeah. So, wait, so when you say 3D um, uh, in, your, in your childhood, like how old were you? When you started 3D doing it? was later. So, I mean, Harry Potter came way later. So, that was not childhood exactly. That was like um, 11, 10, 11, 11, 2007 types. But uh, yeah. I think uh, the scribbles, that goes way back. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> it's not a long back, actually. So, uh, yeah, that was during my third grade or fourth grade. I think I started with it. Before you went into 3D, did you do any other art, like with acrylics, or, or did you just jump from scribbles color. straight at the 3D? Okay. <laughs> okay I just bridged color. the gap there. Just like that. <laughs> Maybe it's this morning thing. I need a coffee or anything. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think uh, I did a lot of watercolors in between. Uh, okay. And then, yeah, eventually. So it was on and off between technology. and I mean, I, I used to do a lot on technology side, so science side. So art and science thing used to be balanced from that very beginning. So sometimes I work on art. Okay, okay. And so you, the types of art that you would get into, um, or that you're currently currently working with, I, it looks like it's uh, VR, AR, mm -hmm. um, AI. Uh, tell yeah. me, tell me about all all of that. How did you get into that? Um, what interested you about it? Yeah. So uh, I think. Uh, as I said, uh, probably down the line, uh, I think uh, this was during college, uh, uh, going back uh, 10, 12 years back, I started uh, delving into using interactivity and 3D together. So that is not necessarily uh, static 3D, but moving, animating, and somehow we could interact with it. And probably down the same lines, after a few years, I, I started working on how uh, I started when I, when I got my first job, I, I started working on some of this 
uh, interaction projects using uh, gestures and uh, you know moving materials, moving 2D graphics. And that's kind of how I got into this whole interaction design area and I started seeing what all are the venues of exploration where we could showcase some kind of an experience in a different way where the person who is uh, viewing the experience is an active participant in it, rather than you know he or she is just staying and looking at it. So that is a different experience altogether, but I wanted the person to participate in it. And that's how I think VR and AR proved out to be a really good medium where you know, we have this interaction happening between the people and it's also the whole concept of immersion came in. So yeah, I think uh, I've picked up some skills on the line on the way and uh, yeah, I went along with it. AI specifically is a very recent thing. Uh, I mean, I have been seeing a lot of amazing artists working in uh, creating new uh, things with artificial intelligence. And I started last year with it, to be honest, with our yeah. based on it. Was that the the AI bot? Uh, yeah, it or... yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, uh, tell I, me I, more I, about. I, I don't want to call it her, or maybe I should, or I wouldn't. I initially <laughs> did, but anyway. So my point <laughs> is that Aurea uh, was a bot, which is uh, so it was uh, unique in the thing that it was a. Uh, uh, it was a bot in the clouds. We called it the artist in the clouds. So it, it, it's in a cloud server somewhere, and you know it's it's kind of creating this art every day. So it essentially uh, used a pipeline algorithm uh, sets uh, of uh, using AI uh, AI algorithm. Sorry, and it created these unique uh, images out, and it used to post every day to uh, the social media channels, Instagram, Twitter. And so yeah, it, it came out as a very interesting idea. Initially, I worked it out with one of my engineering friends. So I, I myself wasn't into uh, coding AI algorithms at that time, so I got the help of my engineering friend. And then down the line, I picked up that skill. So yeah, it, it, was, it was a cool thing which we used to try out and then it went into a whole new level. Yeah, so so it, what what was her full name or, or, or it? Aurea Cathy. <laughs> Or yeah. Kati, K A T H I. Okay. So that's, and yeah, uh, just just to say the name is kind of a play. There. If you if you mix up the letters, it will become AI Haiku Bot. So it's like AI okay. Haiku and Bot. So yeah, wow, we just okay. we just mix up the name. Yeah. That's awesome. And so, uh, so it was not drawings that Aria would do. It would be haikus or poems, short poems of some sort. Yeah. So. Uh, its pipeline is such that it starts by creating a poem, a haiku specifically, and from the haiku it will generate an image based on some of the text in the haiku, and then it will style that image and post it to the social media channel with the image and the poem together. Oh, yeah. okay, got it. Got so it. poet artist. And so, it's uh, AI. It's AI, which means machine learning. So how long has she been doing this? Or Yeah, so this was, we intended it to be a one-year project. Uh, started 2019 Jan New Year uh, day and ended uh, December 31st, 2019. So it was a one-year, uh, it, posted, it posted for one year in both channels, yeah. And did you see a progression of her getting better or uh, some type of improvement? Yeah, so... Uh, Usually for improvement, we will have to, you know, kind of give a feedback back, you know, so uh -huh. uh, So we didn't give the feedback back. So uh, we there, there was no feedback as such. It was it was kind of, you know, kind of a sequence uh, serial thing. So uh, Although that is said, we did work on its uh, core algorithms over time and it became more coherent towards the end. It was some of the initial state uh, Times we are delving into language models and all those things. So uh, we did get a lot of coherency in terms of uh, its content by the end. Although the image, uh, we we thought of having more form image, like you know you understand what it is. But we uh, we found that the whole uh, AI art, uh, the beauty of AI art is in the 
non-interpretability of the art, uh, the abstractness maybe. So that's why we left it to be abstract art itself rather than you know, figurative art or something like that. I see, I see. Wow, very interesting. Um, so I, I know that you've gotten into all kinds of projects here. I saw on Twitter that you, uh, it says polymath in the description. So I know that you've had patents and different types of projects and AI brushes. Um, and I've seen that you've done like a, a, a demo for Adobe. Yeah. Uh, so it would be great if you could like talk more about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, the word polymath is a new, a recent discovery. I found this, I mean, whatever we write in Twitter and other things, those are just <laughs> things to, you know, make sure people are uh, right, interested and everything. But uh, yeah. I think I, I would say I am more of just a creative and a technologist trying to, you know, create something. That's, 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 that's the only core thing of it. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, I think, um, so uh, I was working with Adobe for uh, about two to three years, and it was one of the best uh, best times of my life, I would say. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, we, we will be creating for creatives. Every time we make something, we have to think from the perspective of a creative. We need to learn what, uh, how they create, what are their tools, what are their aspirations, how do they even go about living their lives how do they earn and all those things. And we have to make sure we create these things, uh, the tools which we are creating, such that it helps them. So uh, interestingly enough, I was in a more of an innovation lab, uh, which uh, was exploring the future of creation. What would be the future uh, creativity like? What all are the tools like? What would people try to make? And that's, I mean, a lot of it involved machine learning, we had uh, AI, VR uh, technologies we used to try with gestures, we used to try a lot of things. And uh, a lot of these things used to translate into publications and patents and some of them which I've also put up. So uh, the thing is that we always try to, you know, rather than thinking of, okay, what is now? I mean, we should, of course, think of what is now, but we should be, we had to think of how would the future be? We were constantly reimagining and uh, figuring out how would creatives approach something in the future? How would, you know, you just saw machine learning come out all together with a lot of new creative expressions. Now, how do you sort this out? How, how do you make sure it's it's something consumable by everyone? So that's that's kind of where we used to uh, explore these things. And I think perhaps one of the striking factors, because I used to uh, draw and paint and everything, I used to like the whole... Uh, you know, hand-based drawing kind of uh, uh, tools. And I found that the digital alter ego for that is the digital brushes. And uh, one of the one of my friends and uh, really uh, good creative in Adobe was uh, Kyle Webster, who used to make all these amazing digital brushes. So I was inspired from him and I tried to create digital brushes, but not, uh, necessarily what is uh, in, uh, available right now, but what, what would be the future? So one of the explorations on those lines was uh, something called animation brushes. So you, you, can, uh, you can definitely draw static uh, drawings with brushes, but what if you could draw animations with those brushes? And that translated into a long one-year project and that went into uh, something called Brush Bounty, which I presented at Adobe Max 2018. And yeah, that, that was kind of my first uh, uh, big stage presentation in Los Angeles. Yeah, it was a good, good venue. You looked very comfortable on stage. Good job. <laughs> oh, that's, that's <laughs> not me. That's all the audiences. <laughs> they they <laughs> took us to a lot of training. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I know that you're working with another artist, um, Indrani Mitra. Uh, on something called Hidden Gems for one of the platforms mm -hmm. that you're on, Maker's Place. Yeah. So can you tell us more about, about that and how you, how you even got into it? Like, how did you mm. colla start collaborating with Indrani, things like that? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I, I mean, I started in crypto art largely in February of this year. I think so, yeah, February or March maybe, yeah. 
So uh, one of the things I, uh, one of the conferences or events which I attended at that time was the Rare Art Festival. And there was this conversation by Art No, Jason Bailey. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was he was telling about how uh, it's not just about, you know, it's uh, creating, but it's all about giving back. You know, you should, you should make sure that everybody's involved. And there's this whole community evolving around things. So uh, I was new in this field. I I knew that I could just keep creating and you know, get paid for it or get some value out of it. But I felt uh, there was there was these conversations which I was having with people. I felt that was important. And one of the hardest part uh, when I came into Maker's Place was gaining visibility uh, in terms of you know making sure. I mean, we have had this conversation also. You should remember during the early yeah, stages. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it was. I mean. Makerspace is an amazing platform. There's a lot of ways you can gain visibility there, but uh, you know it's it's really tricky when it comes to a uh, lot of collectors getting uh, seeing your work. So I tried to empathize with others who would have the same feeling, and I wanted you know to make something or do something about it, such that it's it's uh, it helps them, such that uh, you know you could uh, make sure their work has more visibility. Now. I don't want to start another platform. I don't want to start another, you know, whole new venture or anything like that. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just, I just wanted something, you know, which I could do, which will uh, help uh, them easily. And one of the things which came to mind was why not write about it? And that's when I came up with this idea about uh, hidden gems, which is largely finding out those uh, very new artists, very emergent artists uh, in Maker's Place or, uh, other platforms and you know just writing a review about it. I mean I like to write, uh, look at art I like to you know admire it I like to think about it and I like to write about it so I just use that and I just wrote uh, one of those edition and so let me just see if someone will even you know look at it and then there was a whole lot of interest everybody started talking about it asking me uh, who are these artists? Uh, what are you? I mean, who are you? And uh, how did you start here? A lot of conversations started, and I felt that was that was really good. And it's being a small community, it really, uh, you know, you have these conversations uh, with everyone, and you you are every day talking to people, new people, uh, and you know, evolving on the same line. So one of the conversations I had with Indrani was on uh, regarding uh, new artworks, and you know, uh, something on you know, helping others and all those things. And Indra, I asked Indrani, why don't you also join? I mean, she has an amazing, uh, uh, amazing capability to play with words. She's really good at writing. So I thought, why not uh, you also give a chance, uh, give a try at this? And she was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we wrote one together and we made an official uh, Twitter channel and everything. And it, it worked out well. And then uh, down the line, we had a conversation with the Makers Please team and we thought uh, uh, we we decided to make it exclusive for Makers Place, and uh, yeah, right now we are writing to the official Makers Place blog as uh, hidden gems. That's awesome. Yeah. Now okay. I do recall you had mentioned something about dreaming about boats, and that's what led oh, you. Oh yeah. So uh, <laughs> that is uh, something about. So uh, I uh, I think uh, perhaps it was. A year, two years back. Two years back, I started having a lot of dreams about boats, and that's kind of what uh, interested me uh, into. I mean, I it, it kind of translated into a lot of my paintings. I've drawn with boats. I've drawn, uh, you know, parts of boats and all those things. Uh, but uh, that eventually led into one of those. I mean, uh, I talked to Indrani, and she had she had one painting based out of boat, and I instantly okay, this is something I want, and I bought it. And then another thing was that I was searching these uh, emergent artists, and one of those really key artists who was working on uh, recently into maker space. I saw him drawing an amazing, amazing uh, painting with boat uh, with a boat, and I said like, dude, I want to write about this. This is so this has so much meaning in it. <laughs> There is, there is so much about it that, you know, it's not just absorbing the user, but, uh, sorry, I just go into the word user, absorbing the audience, but also it also, you know, has a lot of meaning in terms of not being a static image, but there is 
some event happening, some movement happening. So we try to think of the past and the present and the future of that particular image. So uh, what happened uh, is that there is this image of a boat in a still water. And I, all I could think of what was how did the boat get there? Where is it going? What would, what would have happened if it reaches the horizon and all those things? And like, this is such a deep image. And I, I wrote about it. And that was one of the first, first ones I wrote about and one of the most interesting ones I like. Um, yeah, it says here that when you uh, dream of boats, it, it often refers to a spiritual journey. <laughs> oh. If you want to, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, on, a, on a maybe a sadder note, a uh, couple of days after the dreams on boats happened, uh, there was a serious flood in my state. <gasps> uh, what? Yeah. I wasn't here, though. I was in another state. But there was a very serious, one of the biggest floods in probably a century here. And there was, there was a lot of boats coming in and everybody was being rescued. And I'm like, okay, maybe I just, was it this that I was dreaming of? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting. But uh, to be fair, I even after the days of the floods and we all recovered and we, are, we learned from the chapter, uh, we moved on. Uh, so even after days after the flood, I kept dreaming about boats. So I understood that it's not just you know stuck to that particular boat. But it's, it's kind of a journey. So I, I, yeah, maybe it is wow, a spiritual journey. Yeah, yeah, after all. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> or maybe you're just psychic. Maybe you're just oh. psychic. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, and uh, who are, who actually uh, inspires you? What or what what inspires you? I think. Um, I mean, people don't really admit it usually, but for me, one of the biggest inspiration is social media channels out there. Like, I see people creating, and that is what majorly in inspires me. Like, people post something new, and I'm like, how did he or she think about it? Where, what is his or her background, and how, how, what are the tools, and all those things. So, that is what inspires me initially. And then I kind of, you know, I do my research and I start figuring out things and, you know, is there something I can do and all those things. So uh, there is something which, there is this whole conversation about people uh, copying or people, uh, you know, uh, making the same art someone else created or making, uh, a, you know, something. So every time you create something, people say, this is already there. I've, I've seen this somewhere else. And you're like, you made this amazing thing and suddenly you hear that. But what I really understood over time is that we are a collective. Human beings as such as a collective. So when someone creates, it's not one entity which is separate, separately isolated that is creating. But it's a, it's a community creating. Nobody owns anything specifically. So that way when you create something, it's not something out of the it's not something completely new, which has not existed in the history of the world. There is always cross relations. But of course, if it is like exactly the same, there is no meaning to it. I mean, it's what are you creating new? But if there is something that is there, it's, it's, it's a creation of the community, whatever you create. It's not really that, uh, you know, it's just an individual thing. You know, it's, no, this is mine. This is, I just made this out of the blue. You know, it's, it's not, that's not how it happens. It's, it's the community that is, making you or helping you create it so that way when i look at it that is how inspiration strikes me in last week perhaps uh to tell one person who has inspired me a lot in my life i would say the name of john maeda so uh, yeah john maeda is a uh, is a i would say a designer technologist but he is much more than that and uh, he was previously with mit and then he was the uh, he was the president of uh, Rhode Island's RISD, Rhode Island School, and then he is now with Publicist Sapien. But he was one of the people who uh, started a lot of things in terms of uh, designing uh, in the field of design and technology together. And he is also one of those people who start. So I, I, uh, I think perhaps during the same conference at Adobe, I met him. Uh, in 2018 in Los Angeles and it was it was one of those very unique moments for me and one of the things he presented was this interface of having a code 
uh, written down as a sketch in terms of uh, you have this interface which is called a sketchbook or probably like something like a place where you're not exactly you know developing something but you're making a sketch out of it by writing code so this was one of one of the earliest inspirations which i think uh, his uh, his students took forward and created uh, this uh, pro this tool called processing which is something widely used right now in the in the field of creative technology and i myself have used it a lot so the fact that i knew this is how processing the idea of processing came out that just that just blew my mind it was a great time to have a conversation with him you know shake his hand and I'm like okay this is amazing i'm meeting my uh, the person i look up to most and yeah that was really wow great. that must have been awesome so like what did what did you guys talk about did you talk about so uh, it was kind of a fanboy moment so it was last day <laughs> about how i like to work and uh, all this but, yeah i mean uh, we had this very short chat he, he just gave the talk and you know we had this short chat and I talked about uh, processing and uh, how it has helped, how it has evolved thing uh, us uh, along the way. And he he was uh, he was he was happy to know that you know there are these people who are designers who are also working in technology. I mean that's something uh, I mean that's something uniquely which I like so much myself. Uh, so that's something I wanted to express to him. And yeah, uh, a very short chat. probably we'll have a longer chat later on hopefully yeah <laughs> oh wow that would be awesome um i i think this would be a good time for us to start talking about since you're talking about processing and generative art and you did mention interactive art we could actually go into your two pieces that um uh regalia and in other news that would be Yeah. And I I I did notice that they're both on async. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you could talk more about what async is all about and then go into your pieces. Sure. So async is uh so uh the first time I saw async was I saw this word programmable art and it instantly reflected to me because it was creativity technology. Yeah. That's it. So I was trying to find out what is this. And then I discovered it was it was uh, a translation of artworks created in uh, layers but you could have some kind of a, you know movement or uh, some kind of a dynamism in this artwork and i was really really uh, really hold to, i held on to this idea because th there was there was a lot of platforms out there right now even uh, we try to create all these platforms but the, most of it was uh, static art that was being showcased or there is movies or videos but there was never really something which is uniquely dynamic and that way uh, in the crypto art space async has uh, placed themselves very uniquely so i subscribed to i mean i applied as an artist there and uh, uh, luckily i think after a week or two they accepted me and i started having conversation they were an amazing team they are an amazing team uh, and i i started to talk to them to understand both the whole process so they are not trying to you know instantly bombard everyone with code and you know all these uh, problems of uh, programming but they are trying to make sure that the whole uh, traditional artists or some of those newer digital artists can also embrace this programmable uh, technology can we bridge the gap such that it's an inclusive way of bringing everyone together into programmable art. that just that just blew my mind i'm mean, like they're not they're not making this exclusive elite class where you know you have only this really great professionals who are making this but uh sorry you're really great uh, technologists who are making this but you are making all all artists and everyone together so i started conversing with them and uh, they should have told me about the whole uh, concept the idea and everything and i thought uh perhaps for myself to get used to the platform i wanted to start with something with a simple uh you know simple uh, not many uh you know not many parallels not many uh moving pieces but something with a simple concept and uh that's when i started in other news in other news was a photographic art 
perhaps the first one async it was uh, a series of photographs which i clicked uh, a few years back in hyderabad and it's on the concept of how the creator consumes his or her own creations so when times uh, like perhaps the pandemic situation happens and we are at a situation where we have to consume our own creations like for example if you are someone who creates uh, uh food articles you you cook you you own a restaurant or something the situation has reached some uh, to a critical situation that you have to consume your own creations you you uh, or you 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 make something at uh, something like art and i'll have to buy my own art i mean that's that's kind of a very very weird situation out there so that's kind of what i was trying to propose what happens when this vicious cycle of uh, uh, someone creating uh, something and then consuming that happens and it kind of related very much to the pandemic situation and i used those photographs there in fact one of the unique things was that i myself bought one of the layers of the art to complete the cycle uh, so yeah that's that's how it went out that's a very cool concept Thank you. Yeah, so I see you have s seven, seven uh, others. You call them others yeah. that would be um, featured in the in this newspaper. Yes. So uh, it was uh, on the concept of this uh, uh, mythical king called Ravana. So Ravana was supposed to be the evil king, and uh, uh, Ravana had ten head heads. So each head had uh, you know different. Uh, kind of expressions and uh, thinking capabilities and all those things. But uh, each of these 10 heads represented, you know, the 10 heads of evil and all those things. So uh, if you if you see the photograph, the seven or probably it was total uh, nine in number. Uh, two of them are in another layer, hidden layer, and which is what I bought. So I'm the 10th person. So it's like seven images, two hidden images and one me myself so if you look at the seven images you'll see that each of the head is turned slightly towards one direction so it starts yeah. from the left and then it goes to the center and then towards the right so that's like uh, if you imagine 10 heads to a person and you take a photo of the person it's like you know it pans slowly to one side so that's how the photographs were taken i some of them i had to lie down on the road when there is a huge traffic going on to take the right oh, wow. photographs some of them I had to climb uh, some uh, buildings and, you know, take the photo. It was, it was an amazing experience. But yeah, oh, uh, that was my first dates in country. I think, uh, yeah. And I, I noticed that in uh, the headline, um, one says other news and it looks like the undo. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, the what, is, what is that? What is that about? So I wanted one layer which is uh, uh, to represent the newspaper titles. So these newspaper titles were uh, kind of named based on some of the popular newspapers in my country and uh, abroad. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, there was uh, there was New York Times. I mean, there is New York Times, and I I named it New York Wines. And okay. is fine. So, uh, uh, so I just wanted a relation where you are showing a dystopia and there is a lot of problems happening and that is where the situation happens. And the title itself reflects the situation. And that mm -hmm. is how uh, some of these uh, names came out. The specific word Andu came from the Indian newspaper, The Hindu. So it's like you uh, there is uh, you there is a situation and you want to undo it. How do you do it? You really can't do it. And if you really zoom into the newspapers, you will see the text. The text, some of it also is uh, about the pandemic and all those situations and everything. So that's also kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, very cool. I like all the detail that went into it. How awesome! Let's cover reg regalia, which is a very it's generative and interactive, participatory, really interesting. Uh, tell me more about that. Okay, so uh, Regalia specifically came out as this uh, con from this concept of creating for creation. So you're not just creating, but you're also creating such that someone else can also create. 
So you're collaborating with the audience. So uh, Async already had uh, this uh, idea of involving the collectors in the creation. So you can switch layers and the collectors can switch the layers and the creation changes. So it was a collaboration between the creator and the collector, but I also wanted uh, the audience to be part of it. So now the whole ecosystem, the creator, the audience, and the collector comes together. So that is how the creation for creation concept of Ricardia came in. And uh, I was working in generative uh, code at that time, and I thought, why not create a simple code? So I talked with Conlon from Async, and they said, they have this possibility of linking with the uh, Async platform using one of their APIs. And that was very interesting. It opened up a lot of possibilities. And I was kind of intimidated by the possibilities, to be frank. But uh, I kind of used that situation to create a simple code, which was a symmetric code. It's, not, it's nothing new. Uh, but it, it kind of uh, started this whole concept of how can you create and someone else participate, collaborate with you, and create the final creation. And uh, when you're creating this, the color palette or uh, the style of it can be controlled by someone who collects the art. So uh, bringing all these together, Regalia became uh, an art group, which was kind of the first time in the crypto art world where you bring all these pieces together and you have a generative art, which is, you know, actively resting somewhere else and you can interact with it. So it was an interactive art and it's also a participatory art where the audience also participates with it. So uh, I, we, we, we thought uh, this is unique, but we didn't know how people would perceive it. And we thought, we let's just, just run a small competition around this. And then uh, so, much, so many people were excited about this. So many people started creating it. So many people shared their creations and I myself was blown away by some of those creations because I never thought it could reset. So that's that's uh, emergence, right? You make something and you don't know how what what capabilities it could have, and then you you I, I felt so good that uh, everybody participated and yeah, and that's how the whole uh, Regalia story went. Yeah. Very cool. I um so I'm actually looking at this now. I I. I'm looking at um, actually in other news, and in other news, it shows a state. Ch or is there a state change on this? There's there only state, state change? changes. Yeah, I mean, basically, you can just switch the uh, layer uh, states. That's all. Yeah. Oh, okay. So actually, the owner would be able to change it, or does it depend on something happening? Because I, the, isn't it? News? There's. Yeah. Sorry. Or e either one, like is like for instance, just just so regular people can understand like what yeah. what this all means. Yeah. Like if it were to be sunny outside, maybe something would change in your art. Or if Bitcoin were to you know I don't know make a big dip, then something would change. Is is that is is yeah. there anything? Yeah. Is, what does the state change? Yeah. What does it depend on? Let me explain. Uh, so in other news is uh, is a regular, not a regular. It's it's an async art in its, in its whole glory, in the sense that uh, it has layers and the layer state changes. As in, you have one image that could be replaced by another image, could be replaced by another image. So in other news was a basic try, basic uh, attempt at my first async art. But on the other hand, regalia. So. Uh, Async already has this integration with uh, some of these uh, things like uh, the time of the day or uh, you know Bitcoin prices and all those things. Uh, so when you integrate that with your artwork and you have these layers, you could probably change the layer based on each of these uh, things. So you could have one layer to show up, uh, sorry, one image to show up in one day and another image to show up in another day. Uh, so recently, there was this amazing creation by Yura Meron, which was uh, he. I think uh, there. Were, I think it's Yura. Uh, there were three sixty five uh, images, so which shows up every day of the year, which is amazing. And uh, I think uh, Regalia went one step for ahead, and I kind of linked this layer state changes to the controls of Regalia, basically the settings of Regalia, wherein. 
you have a layer state change, which the collector would collect and, you know, will be switching the layer state. But what will happen is the setting of regalia changes such that uh, the brush size changes. So if I have a brush size layer, I can change the brush size to small, big, or medium. So people will draw with a big brush if the collector switches it to a big brush. On the other hand, yeah, similarly, if there is a color palette, so I had I think six color palettes, maybe six yeah, or five yeah. color palettes. Yeah, so the collector can switch the color palettes if he or she owns the color color owns the layer, and then suddenly whoever creates something with regalia will be using that color palette. Yeah. So yeah, they they kind of uh, I would say they kind of control the canvas, the collectors, and uh, I have provided this canvas to them. And the audience starts drawing on the canvas. That's how it works. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you for explaining that. Because I know, I mean, this is a very new concept. Yeah. You know, very, yeah. very awesome concept. And uh, yeah. I, I just would love more artists to know about async for sure. So let's talk more about blockchain. Like, how did you start getting into? Did you know about Bitcoin first or did you just kind of like, how did you trip into the crypto art world? So I think uh, Bitcoin was, I mean, you hear it all over the place. It's in the news. It's in uh, people start talking about it all the time, uh, cryptocurrency. But uh, to be honest, from where I am from, it was it was something, uh, it sounded like initially a make a be rich quick scheme kind of a thing. You know? uh, so uh, I was really not interested in the beginning. And I think perhaps that is also the entry barrier for many people from my place also uh, to get into this because it's suddenly people are getting rich, some, suddenly people are losing money, should be or get into it. Nobody understands the real concept. So uh, I, perhaps during my time at Adobe, I started reading about blockchain specifically. What does blockchain do? What is the whole concept of decentralization? Uh, mean uh, how do you go about uh, creating decentralized uh, system and we also had some uh, events based on that and i got to know more about blockchain then but i still wasn't uh, in, into crypto uh, currency as such so uh, as i see it blockchain is separate and cryptocurrency is separate i mean both are linked together but when you are a new person, you're entering into a world uh, like this, you shouldn't, uh, you know, merge them together because it will see into, seem intimidated to you because finances come together along with the possibility of having such a decentralized system. So if you're worried about, if you're, uh, if you're, uh, if you think, uh, if you're apprehensive about uh, finances, you might not get into the whole platform. You're missing out on a lot. So that's why I, I try to see blockchain as separate and crypto as cryptocurrency as separate. And I started uh, being a creative uh, crypto art was probably the first thing which I could even, you know, uh, find out what is happening about. So uh, I learned about super rare from one of my, so I had this, we had this group for generative artists, which is uh, largely a group for uh, people like us creating uh, generative art and there was one of my friends who was posting regularly in twitter uh, on how he posted a creation in super rare and he got it sold i naturally was interested coming from a marketplace kind of a, a, a background and i wanted to especially uh, we used to work on marketplaces back then so uh, i wanted to know what exactly is uh, this and he kind of onboarded me into the whole concept of how blockchain is decentralized you have a creation which can be put into this and it will be unique and suddenly this kind of reminded me of an idea previously which i had where i was thinking of how art could be unique and how it could be unique if it is said unique by a lot of people so i'm like saying okay this this is this belongs to leonardo da vinci if everyone says that then it is it does belong to leonardo da vinci so that is exactly what we are. What is happening in blockchain? You have a lot of systems saying this is this belongs to a particular owner, and uh, that kind of you know was an easy connect for me, and that's how probably I started uh, in the crypto art blockchain world. But uh, again, cryptocurrency was something which I was like, oh, okay, I don't know about this, and in my country there was regulations against this, perhaps in two thousand nineteen. 
so I couldn't even you know start with it. Also, I think the regulations were uh, relaxed early this year. Uh, so um, only after that could I even you know start venturing into uh, what is cryptocurrency and how do you go about it. So yeah, I think that's how it all started. Very cool. And we, you got to give the artist a shout out. Who, which artist is this? On I have been yeah. I mean his name is Dane. Uh, he is one of my really good friends in the space. So okay. uh, Dame is the person who introduced me. He's an amazing friend and we have been having conversations. So I met him in the Generative Arts group and then he was the one who introduced me to Maker's Place to begin with. And uh, I, uh, I, I mean, since then I, I have so much gratitude to him for introducing me to Maker's Place. And uh, I think he himself uh, went out of the crypto world for some time and then came back and then we uh, were having a lot of conversation on those. It's, 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 yeah, it's him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Dame. <laughs> yes. So um, that, I guess that would be a, a, a good segue into like collaborations and community. I know the community is really important to you. Uh, you mentioned something about the hashtag grow together, things like that. Can you talk more about like the importance of that and, and why? Yeah, so I think this kind of relates to the couple of philosophies which I mentioned about creating for creating and also the concept that it's it's not just one person creating. Uh, you learn from a lot of people, you are uh, connecting with a lot of people and you create based on that. So uh, essentially when you make an art and you say this is a masterpiece and it sells for like a billion dollars or something like that, that's uh, not necessarily, you're not the only person. When you win an award or something, you're not the only person who's winning it. You're, you, you, when you make a make a big venture and become successful, it's not just you who is making it. It's, it's a lot of people around it. It's a lot of things which happen that lead to that. So I think it's really important that uh, these people are also considered when we are growing. And I, as I see it, my growth, myself, over the years has happened not because i was like a, you know spearheaded person just going in one direction i used to do that for some years over back then i just was like you know this focused person who just wants you know you just want to do my stuff and you know get there but i realized that if people are growing with you it's uh it's it's a very good thing that you will always have people around you to you know guide you criticize you make sure you're on the track or even help you. I mean, of course, help us a lot. And it's always there. I mean, it's not like you're keeping them separate. So when you win something, you will see that there are a lot of others who are also winning and that wins are your wins also. And your wins are their wins also. So you're not winning as a single person. You're winning as a whole community. And that's really important in this time where there's a lot of divisions and separations happening. I think this whole inclusivity is uh, required. And that's kind of where I used to tell people, hashtag grow together. Let's grow together. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's how this thing came out. And uh, it worked out well for me, and I've seen it work out well for, I mean, Indrani was the person who who would just, just just like that, when I post something, she would just retweet it. I'm like, why Why do you retweet it? I mean, I, I, I just met you. But she was, she was so open to retweeting it. And I'm like, it's that one retweet, gave a lot of eyes to my work and suddenly I realized the importance of that. And that's how, uh, you know, you, you keep sharing, you keep uh, sharing others' work, you keep talking about uh, and involving people in things. I think, yeah, it's always the community that is uh, 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 growing together, right? That's, that's, that's what. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I, I, that, that actually is good to hear that the, that someone, an artist, retweeting your work means a lot to you, because that was definitely a. Um, when I was working for Maker's Place, that was definitely part of the culture for artists. It's like uplift your, uplift the artists in the yes. community. You know, so that's so awesome that. Yeah, that I think meant I think I should mention uh, something that uh, I think uh, it was you who uh, introduced me to this Telegram group uh, of artists. Uh, it was not an artist group. It was a lot of community around crypto art. And uh, that was one of the places where I saw a lot of conversation around this uh, 
people helping each other out people you know directing people and that really uh, helped me into getting the idea of okay there is already a very good community and let's all participate together so i think our conversations initially in makers place also helped in this uh, whole thing together so yeah thanks i'm Anne. so glad yeah, yeah of course yeah for sure um yeah very 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 supportive communities and um and there's i i think that there's also an async discord and in addition to makers place and things like that and the communities around um on those platforms are are awesome so i that so i think that that's a really big benefit of being in the blockchain community that everybody's so supportive what other benefits and joys have you uh, experienced being a part of um the crypto art world and you know or just even being on like maybe even talking about async and and makers place and um what you what have you loved about those platforms or the community a lot of that. things actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh so i think uh i think async specifically was amazing in terms of uh, the whole concept of programmable art that itself was a very big new thing for me uh, when you're talking about programmable art all i could think of was generative art and that's an exclusive elite kind of a group who knows to code and everything but making that inclusive and making it make sure that people everyone can participate in it that was kind of very amazing for me and and like i should really give a shout out to the team there for making that so um async besides just having a really good product right here they also were really good at making sure each of the artists felt really good when they put out something so i knew i was uh, one of the things i mean when, when i converse with them one of the things which i say was so dumb i felt bad about me asking it but they made sure they responded back to me in such a good manner that i realized probably my mistake but they were really you know made sure it's thoughtful enough i mean they handled it very thoughtfully that i didn't feel bad about it i felt that okay this is a community where i can talk uh, as the person i am and they they made sure that happened so that conversation i really love the team because of that and i think uh, if you look at uh, how they promote each of our art uh, in the platform not just in twitter but in their discord uh, in other places when they even have conversations uh, when they go for events that's really amazing i mean they are people who are really vested in their product they are really vested in their users and that's very very uh, much i uh, uh, would appreciate them i also say would say the same thing for makers place because since the beginning i Uh, i've seen a couple of problems in makers place but i know the team has been really hard at work there uh danny and uh, aisha recently uh, i mean and of course you were one of the uh, pioneers there who used to have conversation with and uh, we used to you know i was a participant in the community because uh, the conversations we had so uh, they have i mean makers place has been very actively uh, making sure all these things are resolved that's something very really valuable you know you're not just creating something and leaving it there you're actually making sure it improves every single day that's that's really valuable so uh, i mean that's that's uh, very really appreciate i mean i really appreciate the team for that i think uh, besides of course these things uh, crypto art has given me a lot of friends around the globe i've, I've talked about it uh, a lot of friends and that's really meaningful uh, a lot of people from different continents uh, but one pretty interesting thing uh, is that uh, you know uh, i see a lot of uh, polarization not a lot but there is some polarization which is happening in the community i really hope that it doesn't happen but division is kind of innate to human beings so it there is a chance it might happen so uh, the only thing is that uh, which happens is you learn a lot of things from these conversations you know sometimes you look at a conversation between two opposite parties and you realize that it's not one person who is right or wrong it is maybe we need to think of the concept of right and wrong here we need to think what is right and wrong uh, as a group together so 
this is when uh, this kind of uh, why I'm saying this is important is because I learned something about the concept of debate and dialogue from here. So debate is somewhere where you uh, have uh, you have opposing views and you try to win by making your statement or winning over that. But dialogue is where dialogue is a very deeper concept goes into Greek philosophy and all those things, Socrates time and all this. But uh, what I'm saying is dialogue basically uh, is where you have a conversation. You don't you're not opposing. You're going together. You're trying to ask questions to each other and you're trying to have a dialogue with each other and trying to bring out that information or the knowledge in you, which is already there. So uh, that is where I was looking at these conversations. Every uh, There are times when people are trying to say opposing views and you know trying to win over the other, but why not change a small thing in that conversation and change it from opposing views to just being a battle? Let's see what happens then. I, I mean, that's a big learning for me uh, instantly from there. Uh, then I think one other thing I should mention about blockchain and crypto art uh, is uh, the amazing field of creations that I see every single day from so many amazing creatives. And uh, till date, I, I've always had, I mean, specifically in art, I've always thought of some uh, pieces of art and crypto art when I initially entered that looks really bad. I mean, that is really, I mean, that's not art. That's what I, how I came into crypto art. But when I started reading about it, when I started to understand why do people, so uh, I give this example of glitch art. Uh, glitch art, initially I, I despised it. I, I didn't understand it. I mean, it was, uh, it was really uh, something which was very, uh, you know, jaggy edged and so much high frequency things happening that I never could absorb it. But I took my time and I, uh, you know, read about it. I read about why such aesthetics come out of a person. How, how is this whole uh, evolution from art, which was separate, how did it move into glitch art? What are the tools used? I see it's beautiful. There is, there is, there is so much to it that, that we just see. I mean, it's, it's not just, you know, people making something which is just, you know, high frequency switching between things. It's 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 an art form. It's 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 a lot of things there. So yeah, I think uh, this whole perspective changes in terms of how I view art. That is very important to me. That is that has changed. I mean, I stopped defining art. To be honest, I really don't want to define the word art anymore. <laughs> if you, yeah, yeah <laughs> because it should be as open as possible. Is what I feel. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's been, it's been a topic since uh, Duchamp's toilet. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, um, every, all of that until like Home Depot's trash, yeah. trash bin. It's just, yeah. it's, it'll, con and it will continue. Um, but I love that. I love how uh, you, you talk about dialogue and, and I feel like it's all about intention, right? It's, um, trying to gain understanding, which I feel like you're, I mean, even in your story about uh, gaining an understanding of um, glitch art yeah. uh, is, that's, I, I think that's so important to like have an open mind about that. Um, and I feel like uh, you would assume that artists have, just in general, are, are just more open-minded. Um, but yeah, I can, I can see how uh, it has been a little polarizing um, lately, and hopefully we can yeah, grow, yes. grow together. Hashtag grow together Sorry. instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you? Are there any other struggles? You did. Usually, I'll ask more about like if you've had any other struggles um, um, with the platforms, with the community. But you've you've kind of mentioned uh, those already. Are there? Is there anything else that you've experienced? Uh, yeah. that maybe could be improved hmm. um, i think i think perhaps other than the whole uh, this small fault rise which in that is happening i think um one of the major thing is exclusivity uh, this uh, that's something which is bothering a lot of people as i see it but uh, it has bothered me also because i know that we have to maintain a balance between having quality versus uh, you know, having uh, exclusivity, basically. 
So if say a platform or if say a community has to have a certain group of people, uh, why should we make it exclusive? I mean, this is a deeper philosophical conversation also. But if you make it exclusive, suddenly uh, the value goes up. The value will definitely go up because uh, it's exclusive. It's hard for people to reach. And the quality there would be, you know, uh, to maintain. But if it is open to everyone, uh, everybody would feel good about it, but the value would decrease. Now, how do you strike a balance between this? This is a, such a big problem. But uh, what I see is uh, sometimes it gets really bad. Sometimes it, some, some groups would really love to have exclusive privileges, which is something I, uh, I would appreciate if the group uh, has a way for anyone to get in. But uh, if you're, you know, keeping everyone apart and you just want some groups uh, to have it, that's something which bothers me a lot. And especially you are talking about decentralization. You're not talking about uh, keeping everything in one place. You're keeping every, you're distributing it to among people. You're giving the power to uh, a distributed uh, set of, uh, uh, distributed, uh, you know, network of people. And suddenly you're talking again back to centralization. You're talking about how to make things to, you know, in exclusive elite group kind of thing. That's, that's something which has been bothering me a bit. But uh, as I said, it's not something they could just solve overnight, you know. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm off, I often get concerned about uh, blockchain mirroring the digital yeah. world mirroring the analog world, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, I hope that we stay stay on path and and remember why why we started this in the first place for sure. Awesome. Well, so what what advice would you have for an artist um, who has never done is not really familiar with crypto art but is thinking about it? What advice would you have for them um, entering this world? Yeah, uh, I think first advice specifically for crypto art is think of blockchain and cryptocurrency as separate. Okay, this is probably not to uh, people from countries where cryptocurrency is a common thing and everything, but from people uh, from countries like ours, uh, from India, or maybe some of the other countries uh, where cryptocurrency is a totally new thing to enter into. And everybody is reluctant to enter into because, you know, there is a lot of uh, apprehension there. I would say keep that separate. There is this whole blockchain world where you are making digital art rare. We are not uh, talking about, uh, you know, the whole economics or the tokenomics of it. We are talking about uh, a community where you are making, just like how uh, traditional uh, physical art was rare, uh, we are talking about rare digital art. Now let's see how it works there. Uh, come into this world, start putting up a couple of works and see how it goes. I would say uh, have an experimental mind initially and see how it evolves. And the most important thing is connect with people, learn from others. You need to connect with people to understand how to navigate these platforms. But also if you could, uh, you know, make sure that there is kind of a two-way uh, mutual uh, mutual uh, connection between them with them then that will help you grow also i talked the example of how indrani suddenly retweeted some of my works initially itself so that helped me a lot so that will help you grow also but uh, to anyone starting i would see be experimental about things we have an open mind and you know just start uh, trying out things people know people uh, people in this area know that we all make mistakes, a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes when I came here. And we all learn from that. So just be open to making mistakes and learn from them. That's probably the advice I would give. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And what about blockchain developers? What what would you like them to know? Like for instance, someone, uh, if there's a team there that is maybe creating a new platform for artists or um, even a new blockchain or, like what, what advice would you have for them? Um, I think uh, one of the main things that's concerning the Ethereum platform, the Ethereum blockchain is of course the gas fees. Uh, so the gas fees has been uh, really a uh, hindrance to posting some of the books at some of those critical times. And you know, 
doing a lot of things in the platform. So gas fees is a major concern. Um, I think uh, when you're creating, uh, other than that, when you're creating a decentralized platform, I think uh, again the whole concept of uh, you know keeping it open or uh, keeping it exclusive, that is something of, that's a call you have to take on. You could probably uh, have a platform where everybody can post, everybody can be uh, openly participating, but you would showcase works or you would uh, only those best works comes at the top. So it's open for everyone. Everybody has a say in it, but you are only showcasing the best of the best work. So that way you're not making yourself exclusive. At the same time, you're maintaining quality. I think some of the platforms like Dribble or Pre Dribble is again, I think, I think Behance does it a lot. Uh, Behance is open to everyone and then you can do it like that. So I'm saying uh, not copy the model, but to think of how you could make sure everybody can participate, but at the same time maintain the quality. Uh, I think the third thing that I have to mention uh, in terms of creating uh, a new blockchain or even something for artists is that, um, so, uh, Right now we have rare digital artwork, but can we also think of a digital, a rare digital art connected to the physical world? In terms of can we, can a phys, uh, traditional artist who makes uh, physical art like paintings, can they sell these paintings in the platform? We can do it right now with the technology that is. We can make it into an NFT and then you can sell it. But can we have a formalized process for this? Imagine you have a digital installation, which is at a place and you interact with it with your hands or just a certain thing, but you want this installation to be sold. You want, you want this to be in a marketplace. So how do you do this? There is, I mean, you, you can put it in an exhibition, but having all these technologies, can we do that? Can we have an NFT to represent this blockchain? Uh, sorry, this uh, installation. And can we have that also? Sold? So that way you're not uh, creating a platform just for digital artists, you're creating it for all artists. And uh, I think that's really valuable. Right now I don't see many platforms, maybe any platforms in crypto are doing that. Uh, uh, there, yeah. there is, uh, I think it's Blockchain, Blockchain Art Collective, where they okay. actually put a sticker oh, on, okay. on, on a piece. Um, I, I'm, I, often wonder about like what if someone were to, were to peel the sticker off and, and things yeah. like that so i'm not i'm not quite sure um if there's been any um if they've progressed in any way of uh, improving mm. on that so I'm, I'm not quite sure but okay that's the only one that i know of uh there could mm. be more so yeah yeah i think uh, there's something called digital twin i've been uh, working with them recently for one of my works uh, kind of uh, crypto art, but it's majorly, they provide a DNS for, uh, uh, they give the dot .art domain basically. So your art dot .art will be the, uh, it's kind of, a, they'll give you a website, which is kind of authenticating your uh, artwork, which it's uh, called a digital twin because it's a digital twin of your physical artwork. So, uh. yeah, so that's kind of something I've been looking at and I've kind of put up one of my major arts in that. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, one really good thing to look at how people mix these platforms together. So all kinds of artists come, can come here. And one final thing I would recommend is to have, uh, I think I wanted to discuss this with others also, uh, is to have a page for showing progress, uh, uh, the works in progress or the, uh, how the process basically. So when you have an art, you're just showing just that snapshot. But for many people, at least for me, a lot of the process is interesting. So I want to know how this concept came into mind, how this evolved, the whole story behind it, what are the steps you took, what are the tools you used. If you're open to sharing it, I would love to learn from it, love to read about it. And probably that is how I would be valuing your artwork. Probably that is how you are valuing your artwork. So you should probably show that. So if there is somewhere where you could, you know, write about it, put images and videos and you know, show a process, that would be really amazing. That's, that's wow. uh, something else. Yeah. Yeah. That's, those are great ideas. So what uh, current projects are you in any exhibits, um, IRL or online? 
that you want to other people to know about? Uh, yeah, so uh, a couple of things I've, uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, I recently exhibited uh, a couple of months back at GetApp and uh, uh, in Ars Electronica recently, uh, a project called uh, AI Brushes, which we talked about. So the AI Brushes project, again, was uh, the whole venture into digital brushes with machine learning. And uh, I'm also submitting some of them to uh, the New Rips conference. But uh, one of the videos from that was, uh, I called it the Nova Rem. Uh, that is That kind of went uh, popular in social media, but it again started a whole conversation about how traditional art is to do, you know, different from digital art. You know, people uh, from traditional art world looked at this video. So the video is basically, uh, translating a hand-drawn patch into an augment. I don't know if you've seen it. I have. It's the one that looks like a field with the tree. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. one. That's the one. It's, it's, so you, yeah. it's uh, me drawing on the one side and the digital replica, which is realistic, showing on the other side. It's just yeah. a simple video, but my whole concept was to show that you're moving into this whole digital world. You're not just leaving this traditional world out. You're, you're bringing that also together with you and, you know, you could augment it, you could enhance it, you could do a lot of things with it. So that's kind of how I created it, but suddenly people looked at it as a tool, not as an artwork, as a tool, and you're like, hey, this will be really cool for me, I don't know to draw, so this can make amazing drawing, I just have to, you know, draw something bad and it'll make amazing things for me. Another group of people said, oh, this takes out our job, uh, this artificial intelligence is taking our jobs away, which is big conversation to itself but you see the fear and you see the sudden uh, difference uh, happening uh, in perspectives when you see this work so uh, i i've been i've been trying to understand what all kinds of views such such an artwork has brought into people and uh, that's one of the key works i'm working with right now i mean it's it's done but i'm trying to see uh, people's opinions on it. I've been giving a lot of conversations, a lot of interviews based on that right now, since it's been to Ars Electronica. Uh, so yeah, that's one of my major projects. Another project I have, which is uh, a 3D sculpture, which is um, interactive and generative, as always. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, kind of participatory also, but it's, it's a 3D sculpture. You could keep it in your VR room or it could be in a AR, uh, a AR area, so it could be in AR or VR basically, and it will uh, change based on some kind of input from you. So uh, that's something I'm working on with the async team, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a project which has been going on for I think four or five months now. I think those are two of the major projects which I'm working on right now, yeah. That's exciting. And you said the AI brushes are are done and you're you're gathering feedback. Is this something that will be available to the public someday, or how how can I don't know? Tell me more about that. That's a good question because uh, when I did the AI precious project, some part of me wanted to create a set of tools, and some part of me wanted to just explore and you know create something like a creative expression and artwork or something like that. So. Uh, by the time when I evolved this work, uh, I didn't have a goal in mind, but when I, uh, you know, worked on it for one year and this, these things came out, I never wanted it to be a tool as such. It, there are some parts of it which could be really good tools and that's why I'm kind of writing papers on it. Uh, but the other parts of it were not really tools. Those were kind of, uh, you know, things to invoke questions in people. For example, there was this one uh, video where you could control a slider and uh, suddenly the landscape changes. So uh, there is a slider for uh, snow cover. So you can increase or decrease the snow cover. So snow cover will instantly change. You could uh, increase or decrease the tree cover. So the tree cover will uh, and the landscape changes. So that was not not a tool. I mean, I don't want it to be a tool where you have all these images and you can just change it. That's not what exactly I had in mind. My It was kind of a statement on climate change and how humans can easily control nature. So uh, you can easily, I mean, I shouldn't say easily control nature, that's wrong. 
what i'm saying is so far humans have uh, established so much things that uh, nature has been uh, you know uh, changed dynamically by the influence of humans and that is what i'm trying to show in the video by you know you just move a slider in a ui and suddenly nature changes that's how you're viewing things right now you want to build a house near on a forest you just cut out the forest just build the house there just who, who cares about the whole forest so that's kind of what i'm trying to state from this and i called it the reality editor so it's like you're editing your reality over there but yeah so to answer your question i think part of it were tools which probably hopefully goes into paper and you know probably might be able to convert into something later on but a lot of it was creative expressions explorations some of them are tools yeah i see i see wonderful any anything else that you wanted to talk about as far as your projects or tell us where people can find you how they can find your work yeah. as well uh, so about my projects uh, i I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring in a, a lot of generative art into the platforms. So I've been conversing with some of the platforms to have uh, embedded websites. So we, you're, you're making a generative website and we embed it. So Makers Place has this preview of images and videos, but can we have a preview of a website in that box? So that's, yeah. that's, that's something I've been conversing so that generative artists like us would you know, sell some of our generative art, which is not just an image or a video, but actually something which you could interact with. Mm -hmm. um, and also to find me, I think the best place uh, would be in Twitter. I have kept my messages open so uh, anyone can drop in uh, any message at any time. Uh, so, and also I'm on Instagram. Uh, I think uh, my website, uh, so my website uh, is nurecas.com, nurecas.com. And I put up some of my works there. Uh, it also has an about me page which has a contact field. So you can uh, contact me there as well. So these are kind of the areas uh, where you can find me. And if you really want to meet me uh, physically, you can come all the way to India. I'm <laughs> more than glad to host you. Oh, yeah. that's so very nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for spending time and talking about your work and, and your experiences. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. I mean, uh, I mean, I really like your uh, new venture, Red Digital Bird. I, uh, uh, I would surely uh, look forward to more uh, videos from here. And uh, yeah, all the best for that. And All right. Thank you so much. If you haven't already, please help support this channel by hitting the subscribe button, clicking on the notification bell, and smashing that like button. Thank you, my rare digital birds. Until next time, fly high. <laughs> I wish I could just look at you and, you know, say hi or something, but yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> You can pretend to say hi to uh, alter ego me right now and I can put it. <laughs> <laughs>